You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. 422 days, one man's epic run across America. The first ever. Congratulations, phenomenal achievement. Cheers, la. What made you do it? I just felt like running. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to carry on with uh, just pushing all my stuff in a in a jogging pram. And I had like a like an old hold all with all my clothes in, uh, food underneath, spare trainers underneath, a little bag on the back with had me like, you know, sort of phone and wallet in. So if I went into a shop, I'd just leave the, the pram there. And if any nutritionist followed me on that, got any weapons on you? And I'm like, oh no, mate, I'm, I'm British, just just me razor sharp with. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thinking I'm dead funny, he goes, good, because I got plenty. And just pulls out this 10 inch carving knife from bands. But you know, you said before, did you ever fear for your life? And I just thought, oh my God, this is it, the first night on my own, you know, and the demon's probably still going to be in the air, you know? And um, he goes, if anyone hurts my little girl, I'm going to hurt them real bad. And I was just like, mate, don't worry about it. I just wanted to camp in your yard. Boom, we're on. Today's <laughs> guest, we've got Rob Pope. How are you, brother? I'm really good, man. Really good. It's really good to see you. <laughs> You've just um, done one of the first things ever. Becoming Forest, we'll plug that straight away, which is your book. Um, <laughs> you've ran 15,621 miles in 422 days one man's epic run across America the first ever congratulations phenomenal achievement cheers la what made you do it I just felt like running <laughs> <laughs> class bro no, unbelievable that it's a pleasure to sit across from you like these kind of things is is inspirational and it shows that what can be done when you put your mind to something first and foremost how are you brother I'm doing all right, man. It took me a it took me a good while to not sort of uh, walk like a nine. You know, see when you see like the ninety year old fellas doing the London Marathon and stuff like that. It's I can stand up straight these days, which is nice. You know, mm-hmm. I've finally finally been rolled out, and uh, and sort of psychologically, I think I've got over the the struggle of not being on the road. Something I thought I'd never never get. You know, sort of. Uh, I remember seeing in a Facebook group, and they said. Uh, how does everybody deal with it after the um, after you know you finish your trip across? Because a lot of people have done it once, you know, a couple of nutters have done it twice. It's just the the club that have done it more than that's pretty small. And I was reading this. Of course, I wasn't going to comment and saying, "Oh, well, I'll be fine." But I have been pretty bombproof before in my life, and then I come back from this, and I'm just a bit like there was something just huge that was missing because, like, even though I had to run every day. There was this ultimate freedom that I'd probably never had and never will have ever again. And like, you know, sort of uh, struggling to adjust to that, you know. Yeah, it's it's mad, yeah. Right? When did the book come out? So it was only uh, last week. Yeah. And so it's, it's early doors, you know, sort of um, still getting photos of all my mates just going, look what I've got. Mm. <laughs> and I'm just it's, like, glad someone's getting it. Yeah, it's <laughs> unbelievable. Before we go through it, all, mate, all the runs, let's go. I always go back to the start of my guest, brother, where you grew up and how it all began. Cool. So I grew up in uh, Croxteth in Liverpool. Uh, went to the same junior school as uh, uh, Everton Lumen and he's Wayne Rooney and Franny Jeffers. I actually um, I played in the school B team with Franny Jeffers, um, and like he was the best runner in the school by the mile, and um, and he was a rubbish footballer. Like you know, obviously people can say what they will now, but he's an England international, Arsenal, Everton. And uh, we had a tournament where we got beat six nil, five nil, and four one. Who scored the goal? Yeah. Easy peasy, <laughs> Easy peasy. And um but yeah, like I was never gonna make it as a football. I wasn't in the league of those lads. And they started a cross country uh team sort of at school and my mum was a dead good runner. Um she would have gone to like the world juniors in the hurdles, but she fell down um fell down the stairs on a bus coming home from school and that was her running career over with and stuff. So she was dead supportive of me and it was just me mum. Um, it was her and my dad split up when I was like sort of six month old. Like they'd been together like from the, when they were dead young, and then got married. I came along, and you know, I actually don't know too much about the breakup really, but uh, you know, sort of things happen, don't they? And so uh, she brought me up on her own, like sort of a single parent family. Obviously, uh, single parent families are responsible for all the ills of the uh, of the planet, and nobody, no, not good can ever come of that. Well, uh, 
that's what somebody said to her when she was on Kilroy. And uh, I don't think that MP ever took a beast in like that, like he did off my mum. And she was just like, I'm a single parent family and my lad's going to university. And just this, this is happening all up and down the country. And, you know, she was like, she was my warrior queen. Like she, she proper stuck up for me. You know, she wouldn't necessarily come in and fight me battles, but she certainly made me know which ones I needed to fight. Uh, did you start running? What is, did you start running? Yeah, properly, it probably was just when, when I went to seniors. And um, like I said, we were at school, unusual for Liverpool because we didn't play footy. It was in the winter, it was uh, rugby and cross country. And in the summer, it was um, it was cricket and uh, athletics. And, you know, I wasn't a very good scrum half and I certainly wasn't going to play anywhere else. So it was cross country for me and, uh, you know, trained three times a week. And we, we actually had a really good team. Um, sometimes I was the best in the school. Sometimes me mate Pete was. Um, and we'd like sort of spare each other on and um, we couldn't really be bothered training that much. I remember one race, um, it was a big, massive school called Stonia. It's, you know, the sort of place that's got the uh, the mile long driveway up to it. And we'd both been out on the town the night before. And uh, I think Pete had about eight pints of Guinness and he was better than me at this time. But about like five miles in, I run past him and I see him like sort of buckled over. Uh, bringing all the Guinness back from the night before and I just tapped him on the back and told him he should have stuck to the Newkey Brown like me. Mm. <laughs> and um, But yeah, we didn't really take it that serious and uh, go to uni and sort of it's much more fun to be like I thought in the team environment and so I just went back to footy and um, played loads of footy but I would do the London Marathon every year and my mum would always go and always support me at all of, you know, three places or so around London. And um, I was always fairly decent, never going to be like an international or anything like that. Um, the running sort of changed, like, well, my life sort of really changed, sort of um, would have been around sort of 2002 um, when my mum sort of died. Uh, she had cancer. And, um, Sorry to hear that, brother. Yeah, it's, it's one of these sort of things where like now I'm, I, I just like bringing it up because I feel that when I talk about her, I'm talking to her. You know, and so you can just sort of have that conversation. And so uh, I sort of didn't really lose my way on the running, but I didn't have the didn't have the focus there anymore. And so like sort of when I could have been maybe entering sort of peak stuff, I was just busy having the time of my life, albeit like I joined a band sort of at uni, um, playing footy, you know, chasing the girls or stuff like that. And um, everything settled down after that. And so sort of I meet like my like my, now my wife and my girlfriend at the time and so as as luck would have it uh we ended up emigrating to australia and uh we we're there for like three years and i thought right i need to get a circle of mates when i'm out here i don't just want to sort of you know be super homesick so i thought about joining a footy team but then i thought mouthy mid 30s scouser who fancies himself as a bit of a player turns up in australia that's a journey for a broken leg if ever i saw it you know I even had a look at AFL and then I found out that you pretty much have to be six foot four to play it, and that's definitely a journey to a broken mm. leg. So um joined an athletics club and um just started running with them and who'd have thought that joining a place where everybody was sound and you could get on with and they were faster than you would make you fast. And um I got my marathon down, uh, time down quite a lot. Um and I ended up, I think it was twenty fifteen. Um, I ran the Liverpool Rock and Roll Marathon and I was standing at the start line and said to the lads uh, around me, hey lads, it's, uh, I'm from here and it's my birthday today. Do you mind if I uh, win for the first mile? And of course, everyone was like dead serious and just looked at me like I had two heads. And uh, so at the end of the first mile, I am winning because I've gone like all out. <laughs> and I uh, go past my girlfriend. She's just like clapping, unbelievable, because she's just like, what's happening here? I got over talk. I end up catching this lad up about mile 15, just as my girlfriend was there again. And I said, um, I said, thanks, mate. You just made me look really good in front of me bird there. And he just turns around at me and just like, you said, you had with that fella the other week, so if he was gone. And I was just like, and the fella on the bike in front of me was just like, sort of, hey, mate, you've lost him. He's gone. He's gonna, you're going to win this. And I was just like, oh, mate, this is going to be the best thing. It's my birthday today as well. And so then he was on this pace bike saying to people in the crowd, saying, he's from Liverpool, he's round here, you miserable gets, give him a cheer, and it's his birthday. And um, go down the finish line, win. And um, so, you know, everybody sings happy birthday on the way afterwards and stuff like that. I win the next year. But in between, in Australia, I'd do the Sydney Marathon. And um, I had the most surreal moments of all time. I'm running over the Sydney Abbey Bridge, and I've been, it's in about eighth. 
and I'd been dropped by all these Kenyans at the front and I would, I'd dropped the main pack and there's a point where it just peaks and I couldn't see them in front of me and I couldn't hear anyone behind me and it felt like the end of the world, just literally me alone on the Sydney Alba Bridge and so that sort of euphoria gets me through to the end and I go over the line and the fellow goes, congratulations, Rob, you're Australian champion. And I'm like, oh, Tim, I'm, I'm not Australian. And he just goes, doesn't matter, mate. You've been here long enough. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, I get the list. So you're going over to this, get, get your medal and stuff like that. I didn't say another word. Like if someone just said, like, congratulations to me, I was just like. And I uh, went up there, got me medal, instantly got down off the podium you know, put it in my pocket, just so no one could just go, there's been a terrible mistake, mate. And uh, so I just went and was walking down Sydney High Street, looking at this gold medal saying Australian champion. And then I get this phone call from a fella called Chris Muden, and he was head of Athletics Australia. He's like, congratulations, Rob. And I was just like, cheers, man. And he goes, you know, today it's an IAAF gold race. And I'm like, uh, yeah. And he goes, do you know what that means? And I'm like, no. And he goes, well, because you came in the top 10, you've automatically qualified for the Olympics. So congratulations, mate. You qualify for Rio. And I was just like, what, what do you mean? Like, am I going to Rio? And he goes, no, nah, mate. So we've got a few people that are going for the time. And if they get the time, we'll pick them because they're, they're Australian. But if they don't get the time, would you consider switching nationality? And I was just like, yes, mate, absolutely no question about it, you know. Uh, you know, so I think uh, I, I probably would have got a tattoo of the Australian flag if I'd have had the opportunity, but um, luck sort of uh, went that way. But, uh, they did get the time. Of course, they were going to be professional athletes, and I was still just a joker. And um, I start getting these ideas of grandeur and uh, just thinking, oh, I should, I should do something big here. I should, like, you know, pr try and train properly. And uh, I didn't because uh, I came back to England and I just started this job that just beasted me. It's like five 13 hour days and they promised loads of time off for training. And it just never happened. What were you doing? I was working as a vet. Yeah. And so uh, they said like... Is that what you went to uni for? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's why I went to Australia as well yeah. and stuff like that. It sort of felt that I was over here and I was going nowhere with my job. I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't enjoying it. And then I just got the opportunity to go out there. It's like sort of a, like a mad sort of machem who ran like the university hospital. And he remembered me from playing footy at my old uni. And he just said, hey, just come out here. I'll give you a job. And it's like one of the maddest, the best decisions I've ever made in my life. And um, But yeah, I came back and this new reality, I was just like, this job was doing murdering. And then I needed a, I needed a vent. I needed a release. And we all know where that led. <laughs> uh, is that where the idea that came up for running across America? I think it's had, I'd had the idea for years. And I actually wrote this. Well, I, I read this fella's book. Um, I think it was just called Running Across America. And a fella called Nick Baldock. And just the way he described everything, it was just like, um, you know, it was just the same like moving through somewhere at a slow pace and stuff. And like, you know, there was some scary things, but mostly it just sounded boss. And I was like, right, I'm going to do that one day. And I even wrote him an email uh, as like early as, I think it was about 2006. And I said, and I entitled it Forrest Gump 2. I had no intentions of doing anything relating to Forrest Gump. But if somebody says, I've run across America, almost the guaranteed next line is, like Forrest Gump. He's just going to go, yeah. And he gave me some advice, most of which was like sort of get sponsors <laughs> and, uh, you know, and work hard at doing that. This is by far the hardest thing to do. And, um, Life got in the way, I didn't do it. I was originally thinking about going from Long Beach, uh, California to Long Beach, New York, and I was going to call it the long run home because every every good adventure needs a little tagline, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And um, that never happened. And then I, I thought about doing something else, San Francisco to um, to Boston. Um, and I think I, I brought it up and my mate just said, mate, are you actually going to do this or just talk about it? And then it was only when I came back and I brought it up again, and I think he just raised his eyebrows, and I just went, no, mate, I'm doing it this time, you know. <laughs> and what's the planning goes to go behind that then, to be away, you're away from, your home for 100, 422 days then, just constantly on the road, that, that's a big sacrifice as well, especially you have, you've got a girlfriend, so you've also got, it's a good job as well, like, yeah. to eventually give it all up to then, Go and I'm going to just go and run here for over 15,000 miles. Like, <laughs> what's the planning to behind that to then achieve something like that without injury? And then you've got your food, and then you've got overnight stay. Like, there's fucking so much, mate, we're going to touch on. But how, 
what's the the planning for the first step to get this the ball rolling to do something like this? The first bit that helped was just that uh, there was two there was two things actually. One was the fact that my job was doing me head in. I knew I couldn't stay there because I was just heading for the breakdown. Like just massively overworked. And um, so, you know, that wasn't a thing where I was just like, I can't leave this because I was going to leave it anyway. Um, the second one was just like sort of the the cue to get the kick up the arse to actually do it. And um, so at this point in time, like sort of um, I'd started to get ideas of what I would want to do. And you know, my biggest motivation of all was me mom. And like so she said, um, before she died, like, says, do one thing in your life that makes a difference. And I had no clue what that was going to be. Like, I'd gone to uni, sort of said, got a good job. I even went and did a PhD, like, sort of in sort of a, like vaccine development in tropical disease. But I didn't, I, I just missed the uh, the day to day of being a vet. So that wasn't going to be. And I actually thought at the time that was going to be where my difference was going to get made. And I was a bit disappointed when I quit it because I just thought, it's like a forest gump when he walks through the crowd at the end and the crowd go, no, what are we going to do? And that's what I just thought. thought, Jesus Christ, this was potentially my option to do something. And I didn't think, right, what's next? I just got put to side and I just I'd, had the regret of like sort of maybe balls it up, making the wrong decision. And um, so I thought, right, I'm going to do this and I'm going to make it big. And it, I, hang on, I, can, I could make a difference here if I do it for charity and make it sort of, you know, sufficient, you know, so who am I going to run for? And I thought, well, massively into like conservation and stuff. And when I was 21, my mum uh, adopted a tiger. It's sort of a, with the WWF. And I thought, well, there we go. That's WWF. And what am I going to do? Well, um, I'll do something like massive, like who's done what route? I'm going to do further than they've done. But you can't get, you know, America's almost a square. So you can't really say, oh, I've done the furthest crossing. And then people just go like, well, you're going to run across America like Forrest Gump. And then just thinking, you know, and you start looking up his route, and I actually like was I'd done it before in the past, and I knew roughly what he did. And they say he ran fifteen thousand two hundred and forty-eight miles, and like he crisscrosses the country and everything like that. There's actually a bit of a map in here of the route. It's like a wheel. Yeah, well, it works well with the WWF, uh, yeah. doesn't it? You know, and um. So that's where I started in Mobile, Alabama, yeah, and he heads over to Santa Monica, goes up into Death Valley, down all the way up the east coast to Maine, and goes all the way across the top down to San Francisco, back to South Carolina, and then, of course, he finishes at that place in the desert. And um, so I knew what the route was, and but every now and again I would like, because I'm an arts procrastinator and not necessarily a, a good planner, so I would basically spend a lot of the time planning, just looking up cool places to go. You know, not not like sort of how am I physically going to manage it? I'm just going to go, oh my god! And so if I'm going to do that, I only needed twenty mile detour to go to Vegas. You know, it's I'll do that. I'll mm. alter it. And so I'm googling Forest Gump route, and I just see this headline: man completes Forest Gump route, and I'm just like, you're going to do it. And I was just like, read the sort of thing. And what he's done is he goes from like Santa Monica to Maine, so he's done leg two. And then, so that was the motivation because I just turned around, said to Nadine, said, we've got to go now. That's it. We've just got to go now because otherwise somebody, somebody else is reading this article with the same bloody hell, someone's going to do this. And like, as I said, is anybody going to do it again? Because I don't know, what's the point once someone's done it? Like, you know, um, like obviously Forrest Gump did it, but we all know it's not a documentary. Mm -hmm. but <laughs> and um, yeah, so then it, that was in March and there was six months of actual organisation going in to get us to the start point on September the 15th and you know it's that's when he started because when he runs past that barber shop in Greenbow, Alabama they're talking on the news about uh, President Carter's collapsed in a 10k race that day and um, so you're just like okay well that's when he starts and when does he finish well he says he runs for three days two months I always get this wrong 16 hours 16 days and 14 hours or something like that and I was just like I don't really I don't really fancy that so we're going to have to go I have to go a lot quicker and um so then what you're saying before about where do you stay? What do yeah. you what How do you many do miles stuff? were you running a day? 37 was the average. So over a marathon a day? Yeah. So you had to hit 36, each, 36 or more each day? Yeah, it varied because I was sort of started off like, and so um, like, I think my first two days I ran down to the ocean to Bayou La Battery where Bubba's from, Forest Best uh, Gun, mate. Shrimp. Yeah, yeah green, green boat doesn't exist, but Bayou La Battery does and it's a shrimp in port. And when I went there, I was just getting a little photo, you know, sort of a standing by the dock at the bay. And um, 
and this shrimp and boat just comes past into the shot and I was just like, did you get that? <laughs> like, otherwise I wouldn't have to run after it. But uh, And um, I gradually built up my mileage, but like some days it would be the case that you just go, if we can get here, that's where the campsite is. And it means I don't have to stop here tonight, drive there, we drive back in the morning. It means I can get out of where we stay and um, and just go. Because uh, we looked at options of what to do and you can hire an RV, but we were like self-funding this, you know, and so that's basically money down the gaggle as soon as you spent it and it's so expensive. If you're doing a holiday in a month for America, you hire an RV, but we thought we could be here for like sort of, you know, almost two years. Um, so that was gone. Talks about hire car and motels, keep it a bit cheaper, but then you're still throwing the money away. And so then we gambled on buying this old RV. So we went to this big, huge dealers. I was looking online. It's another way of procrastinate. RVs had no intention of buying. Just going, oh, look, this one is dead nice. It's only 200 grand. <laughs> no, no, we could never afford that. And um, so, yeah, we landed in Houston, uh, picked one, went to the start, and we ended up running back towards Houston, um, where we ended up picking the RV up. And on the road we were... How many calories were you eating a day? About six, seven thousand. How, yeah, what's about, the... about that. Yeah, and so yeah, and it was it was different to whether I was supported when the dean was there with the RV because like sort of you know she'd be looking after me. Although I did have like ham salad sandwiches with Catalina dressing. I'd never had it before I went to America, but I was drinking this stuff like it was wine, you know. Um, every single day I had that for me lunch, apart from the odd time if we were at like a Waffle House or something like that, you know, I'd go mm. in there. Uh, in the morning, I'd have like a protein shake and a couple of bars, get off. I'd have like a second breakfast about like sort of 10, 11, which usually just consisted of donuts, donuts and like sort of chocolate and Carbs. everything like that. Yeah, exactly. And it was a case of you just, what you felt that your body was crying out for. And then I'd, I'd have my lunch, um, loads of crisps and stuff like that. And then at um, a third breakfast after lunch, you know, and then a, a huge dinner. And uh, we'd always have a like a beer every night as well. Like it was just the sort of thing I'd look forward to at the end. I just kind of just want a cold one. And uh, mm. and that was great. It was it wasn't like a holiday. It certainly wasn't for Nads because she was like on the on the sort of the job all the time. Like, you know, and um whereas I was like on this hard but still sightseeing yeah. tour. Uh, but when I was on my own, man, because basically um, we just ran out of money and I had to carry on with uh, just pushing all my stuff in a in a jogging pram. And I had like a like an old hold all with all my clothes in, uh, food underneath, spare trainers underneath, a little bag on the back would have me like, you know, sort of phone and wallet in. So if I went into a mm -hmm. shop, I'd just leave the, the pram there. And if any nutritionist followed me on that, they literally would have been going, mate, don't do this to yourself. But, you know... Like some days it was just so bloody hot. I'd have to go from one fast food place to another, you know. So I'd start the morning and sort of a, have a Macca's breakfast at 11 o'clock. I'd be in Burger King. After that, I'd be somewhere else, you know, just for the air con. Yeah. And I'd be in there just chucking all this, like, sort of coke down my neck and everything. What and, weight uh, did you start? What weight did you finish? Started at 10 stone one and finished at 10 stone three. Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> so you put weight on yeah no class but um you judge that well then well yeah well over over that length of time but yeah. like when i come back like so you know you've interviewed some great fighters and mm -hmm. stuff and you know they have their ups and downs so every now and again when i have to come back for the old dude damn tall yeah. paddy baddy they're fucking up and down man well if you gotta get down to that us, mate. Yeah. You must fucking, <laughs> you're running fifteen thousand miles and mm. they fucking put on weight I must be the skills, blood mate. Uh, exactly. Oh, fucking fat yeah. bastards in disguise. He's going back to the gym. I'm, I'm, I might invite them all out for dinner. <laughs> you know, we'll we'll just have one blowout and sort of before yeah. we all go into a training camp and then we'll see each other yeah. after whatever we've done. You know, and uh, it's like, man, that's like some sort of torture to yourself. <laughs> like how you can just eat that shit and then okay, I need to focus and then actually lose it all like, to get in the shape like Dan told the shape he gets in part of the back like, the shape they actually get in yeah and then just let the hair down and go well fuck it theirs is the mental strength though because they'll be once they're in training camp they're usually eating good gear like sort of you know they'll be on like sort of you know the, the whole wheat and like the, the high quality protein and stuff yeah. but like I, I call it gas station nutrition like so I would just literally you know you go what does breakfast sound like for you it goes like ding and that's the noise of me going through the petrol station door, you know. Yeah. And I'll just go in, I'll pick up a couple of Twixes, like sort of um, obviously with um sort of um 
forest and stuff like that i would drink a shed load of dr pepper because you've got to stay in character haven't you and stuff like that if it was in a bad way i'd go for the can of decent stuff you know yeah. and um uh, what else would get microwavable burritos hot dogs i had so many hot dogs it was unbelievable and uh as you can imagine if you're playing hot dog roulette eventually it'll come and literally bite you on the ass yeah. <laughs> what about when you're running was there any you were you, were you ever in any danger yeah, like sort of there's, if, most of the time you're thinking about traffic and stuff. And um, there's um, the first time across the Mississippi, and that was a huge moment. Like, because obviously, you know, talking about the charity thing before, you see Forrest in it, and it's when he's running across the Mississippi for the fourth time. That's the first time the press hear him, and they say, Why are you running? And of course, he says, Well, I was at the start, you know, I just fell out running. Mm -hmm. um, but they say, You're running for uh, women's rights, world peace, the homeless, the environment, and animals. And of course, WWF take care of the last two and then i found another sort of charity called peace direct that like, basically sort of you know massive women's empowerment they'll like rescue child soldiers but give them homes and jobs of course with the ultimate aim of world peace and uh so it was the whole thing where i was just like this mississippi represents everything and it took me back to what my mum said you know and so when i got there i was just like even like you're in the middle of the country and your goal is to get to an ocean always just aim for the mississippi and then once you get to the Mississippi, you can aim for the ocean. So I was running across the first time in Baton Rouge, um, and I just run with this like Olympian round the track. He's like sort of went to two Olympics, and we just done like sort of a little four hundred meters, and he went easy on me. And um, it's a four lane highway um, with no pavements or hard shoulder or anything like that. With a two hundred foot, foot uh, drop down to the Mississippi, and I'd seen it on the uh, street view, you know, from the satellite, and I just thought. Oh, God, you, you see the shoulder just disappear into this point. And then after that, you're like fully in the path of the lorries. And so I got to the start of it and I thought, if I'm going out, I'm going out in a blaze of glory. And um, pressed play on Guns N' Roses, Welcome to the Jungle. And it's got the line in it, just goes, you know where you are, baby. You're going to die da -na -na, in the jungle. And I uh, went, um... it was a mile long, this bridge. And um, I did that mile in 5.30. You know, and I was GoPro in it as well because I at least wanted somebody to find the memory card and just going, oh, he's so close to getting across that bridge. Mm -hmm. um, that was like, and that happened like a, a fair bit, not to that extent, but like, you know, if you're running at night, you'd be, you'd be shitting yourself the whole time. Like I'd have like the high vis on it, I'd have the lights and stuff. But at the same time I was over there, um, a Kiwi guy was running across and he got taken out by, and he think it was maliciously by a hit and run driver in Ohio and stuff. And he was on the phone to his missus at the time. It's the only reason he found him alive because it just basically happened. And then the police just, she knew where he was and he found him on the road. And of course, after I knew about the baby, it became a complete different mindset because at the start, I'm just thinking, here I am on an adventure, bulletproof, invincible, nothing bad's ever going to happen to me. I'm a scouser, I can talk my way out of any trouble. Uh, and then suddenly, like, sort of if a car was even, like, you know, six inches close to me and I didn't like it, it would just send me into, like, a proper, like, Jesus Christ, dude. You know, sort of, um, and I stopped running at night. And, um, fortunately, I didn't get, like, well, I actually did get it by a car, but it was just at some traffic lights. Mm -hmm. And, um, <laughs> this fella likes it because you can turn right on a red light over there. So I'm just watching this fella and he's inching up towards the junction, but he's, you know, he stopped pretty much. And I go in front of him and as soon as I go in front of him, because he's not looking right, he just guns it and goes right into me and hits the, uh, like the wheel of the stroller. Then that like bites into the rubber, comes up, then he's like, car, it's my hip. And like, I go down and uh, he's buggered the, um, like the, the wheels on both of this. And I just push it to the side and he's literally in his car punching himself in the head. And I just go over and I'm like, mate, what the fuck, you know? And he just goes, the baby, the baby. And I'm just like, mate, there is no baby, but you've got to fix these wheels. And so he got this like big like, sort of lump of metal out and he's banging that. And um, I'm just thinking, one of these times, he's gonna be, someone's going to be doing 50 mile an hour if they hit me. I had, I had a truck jackknife in front of me in Tennessee, fell it on his phone. And a um, huge 18-wheeler, and he finishes 30 foot in front of me, screeching, and I'm just there with a pram and thinking... I was, I'm not even thinking. I'm not thinking I need to get out of the way. I'm not, I don't get to see my life flash before me or anything like that. I was just sort of paralysed, and I just thought, this is it. What kind of days did you have off? Did you ever have a day off from running? I didn't have any... Well, the only time I chose to have a day off was when... Uh, it just happened to be in Vegas. But um, we needed to get the RV serviced. 
And so we just basically whacked it in that day. And then they said, it's going to take a lot longer. And so that was the only, so we just thought we may as well just stay here for the day because we got no other way of getting back. And so that was it. But uh, the only other days I had off apart from that were um, in Memphis, I tore me left quad. Um, and so I woke up the next morning, didn't know I tore me quad, but it was just when I woke up in the morning, it's like someone stuffed a grapefruit under the skin and put my finger in it and it just went, and I thought, oh my God, that's like, that's proper, that's a, that's a tear. And I tried to like walk on it and I couldn't get 30 meters, same the next day. And then the third day I said to like uh, Nadine, I said, if this is the same today, we've just got to go home. She was going home in a week anyway. She got a flight from Nashville. And I said, I'll just come back with you and say, you know, fair dues. We like, gave it a good go and I could walk. And so I said, well, tell you what, take us back to where we started yesterday uh, or two days before. And I walked 27 miles that day and I walked 33 the next day. And then after that, I started to bring a little bit more running in and got just so jammy. Like, see, so you don't run a calf, to, uh, uh, sorry, a quad tear off. I just must have sticky muscles or something. <laughs> what about like Christmas, New Year? What And birthdays, we just, same routine? Uh, sort of, yeah. Like sort of, um, actually, I do say that the only day I never chose to have a day, day off. Like sort of, I was in a, I was in St. Louis and some mates of mine, um, I was way ahead of schedule and they said, come down to Thanksgiving. And so the first Thanksgiving I had was in a Walmart car park where uh, we just basically got like, all the takeaway food from Walmart while everybody was literally having fights over tellies and teddies, you know, for like Black Friday, mm. even though it was still Thursday. And I went down to Atlanta and um, did sort of a, I, I, I ran around Atlanta instead of actually being on the route. But like Christmas, sort of, I was lucky because that was when I was home for visa stuff. Um, and so the only birthday I had, that was uh, not long before I uh, made baby B. <laughs> mm -hmm. So your missus fell pregnant while you before the runner up, during it, was, it? Right in the middle of it, yeah. And so obviously, which... Uh, like, no so, rest for the wicked brother, yeah, have you? Right. You've got to go. <laughs> you know it is, mate. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, people who didn't realise that I'd come home from Chicago would then hear about the baby and they'd just be right. like, dude, how do you feel about that? And I was just like... Oh, it is mine, like. <laughs> uh, people thinking it was happened when you were away. Yeah, but we only found out about the baby when she came back out to join me, you know, and uh, stuff. And um, and then obviously everything was changing. But uh, yeah, other injuries. I was in um, I was in Alabama, mm -hmm. and I had this problem with my hip. It had been an ongoing thing pretty much since North Dakota down to San Francisco, across to South Carolina, and back. And um, it got to the point where. Um, all these tiny little muscles that sort of, you know, you'd never work out in a gym and were now basically bearing the brunt of all this loading because I was taking like 60,000 steps every day, you know, and um, there was so much pain always on my left, but sometimes on both. And it's basically I'd wake up in the morning and find out whether I was going to get 30,000 jolts of pain that day or 60,000. And um, then it started pinching my sciatic nerve. And so I'd be running along and my leg would just give way from under me, like literally as if somebody had just like leg swept me. And um, the, the family that I actually met, the dad of the family called Raimi, who's like sort of a like huge hunter, never thought he'd be the type of fella that I'd get on with, but he was just a diamond. And he said, if you're ever through Alabama, um, you know, look me up and come and stay at mine. And so I knew I was roughly where he lived. And I called him up and I said, Raimi, mate, can you come and pick me up? Because I, I can't walk. Uh, and he goes, where are you? And I say, I'm here and here. And he goes, you're literally right outside my house just literally out, right outside it. And um, he takes me to this doctor and I get like two shots of steroid in my left bum cheek and um, and a, a non-steroidal in my right. And I had two days of recovery there and then I was off. And then the only other time I had to rest was five days at the exact midpoint of Route 66. So, I don't know, 1,200 miles to San Francisco, sorry, Santa Monica, same to Chicago. And there's a motel, a cafe which is shut and a gas station. So I obviously had the ding, and I had the hot dog, and then I had the wild shites. <laughs> yeah, the shites, right? yeah. Uh, five days, literally could not get out of bed without sort of, uh, you know, well, I couldn't eat anything, couldn't keep anything down. Um, and yeah, lost, I think, um, so that's, this is the best diet to go on, man. Six kilos in five days, it was a peach. That's a lot, man. <laughs> Did anybody ever try and run with you? Like they've done in Forrest Gump for them. Yeah, no. Do you have any news reporters of that as well? Do you have any media around you? How, yeah. Or was it just you solo? It was pretty cool, actually, especially like sort of, um, sometimes it was tough to get the press in, the, in like, you know, the likes of um, sort of, you know, New York and San Francisco. 
but at the end of me my first sort of um leg i had like the proper like sort of you know uh she's like the head of the weather but also one of the uh, like the anchor people come out and like you know cover me at the end when i was in like washington this mad see a cbs anchor called adam longo he's, he's just almost like a ron burgundy but without the cock-ups you know and he comes out and runs with me and he just kind of goes <laughs> instead he's saying like you know uh, why are you running like some people just doing he just went what the hell are you thinking <laughs> and uh, he ran with me for a bit nobody ever did a full day um apart from the very last day and um, I had two fellas, one, they were both Navajo because we were running on the Navajo reservation. Uh, one of them was a proper ultra runner and he said he ran like 25 miles a day even in the summer and that day he'd run 40 miles looking for me because he knew I was out on the road somewhere. And um, the other fellow was a, a dude who I met in McDonald's and um, he was probably about my height uh, but probably weighed about five, six stone more. And he said, can I run with you tomorrow? Can I run like all the way? And I was just like, I'm not sure... Like, it's quite a long way, man. I've got, like, a tight schedule. And I, he just went, oh, that's fine. I did 50 miles last weekend. And he was a power lifter. And, yeah, and he ran along with me. And we got joined by loads of people at the end, you know. And, uh, like, had Navajo fire trucks. Uh, like, a mate from school had come out. Uh, we'd gone out sort of um, bevying sort of in Flagstaff uh, a few days previously, just when I arrived back with the baby, uh, you know, so as you do. I mm. <laughs> just said, right, this is going to be a fairly hectic first month of your life. And uh, they came out all the way, and it was just like, it was great. It was representative of, like, everybody I sort of met out there, yeah. you know. It's Tom Hanks and anyone ever reached out? Not yet. <laughs> the, mm. the weekend I finished, it was his 30th wedding anniversary, and... Uh, I've got a feeling that Tom Hanks is probably a little bit sick of Forrest Gump now, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> he, you know, he, he doesn't need the ticket. And um, I can I can imagine him taking all his agents out for dinner and just going, I love you guys, but if any of you ever send me a thing about Forrest Gump again, you're sacked. And everybody would laugh about it, but everyone just goes, never send him a thing about Forrest Gump. So When did you start growing the hair and the beard? So the very first day I, I was in Mobile, Alabama. You actually look like. <laughs> fucking Forrest Gump, mate. I, I, you do. I think I think my missus is sick of me looking at Forrest Gump now, <laughs> and so um, the 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 plan is to look more like Rob in March or something the next year. Um, but I might have a bit more running to do before then. <laughs> and um, so yeah, I go into a uh, barber shop in Mobile, Alabama, called Flukes. And uh, it was a little bit like the barbershop and coming to America. And like, sort of everyone was in there going about the business, like sort of, you know, talking about what was going on. Because, of course, it was a mad time in America. Mm -hmm. We were looking about two months away from, um, from like, President Trump. And um, so I go and sit in his chair and he goes, what do you want? And I show him a picture of Tom Hanks sitting on that bench. And, like, he's just like, and I point then at a photo on the wall of it. And he goes, you want a high and tight? And I'm just like, yeah, and he goes, are you kidding me, man? You ain't got no hidden camera shit here, have you? And so we did actually have a video camera. I said, yeah, but we're not, we're not like taking a mic or anything. And so he's just like, if you want it, man, you know? And so basically gets the clippers out and, you know, literally, you know, number one around the side, a four on top, cutthroat shave. Um, you know, I basically would have looked like someone who's uh, not like as hairy as this, but maybe like sort of modern Kings of Leon, like, but without the good looks, you know, as he did it, but then everything comes off. And um, it was 38 degrees when I left the barbershop and I walked out and my ears were cold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just like, how does that work? And then I didn't, I didn't touch anything, not my hair or anything like that. Apart from, of course, if you're eating a lot of burgers, you soon realise that you can't have your moustache going over your top lip because it doesn't, it doesn't go well. Yeah. Or chicken wings, man, they're the worst. They're the chicken wings are the worst. And so I would like trim all that away. And uh, but everything just went, and you know this is pretty much as long as it gets. I did get because obviously I got I ended up getting married, and I got smart for that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but like, yeah, this is roughly as long as it gets, and I'm just waiting for the hair to catch up now because uh, potentially gonna mm -hmm. find myself on that same stretch of road next year. How what does your wife in that say that to do that? Because it's a sacrifice for her as well. Obviously, you're traveling; it's, yeah. it's something different. But to have that kind of support. It's unbelievable. It, Other people are like, oh, Yeah, no, no, seriously. Like, sort of, um, and to be honest, I don't think either of us imagined how hard it was going to be. We knew it was going to be hard in running, but I've run races before. I know what a hard race is like. What was the hardest but, part? Uh, oh, God. You know, sort of, coming back from some of the injuries was really rough. Like, there was this point in, um, we'd only done 400 miles and I was in Houston. And I'd met, you know, literally I said like sort of self-supported, didn't have anybody doing like PR or anything for me. So I just write on these like sort of, uh, you know, cards, um, social media, run, Rob Lard, run. 
um, and like you know, run across Merrick like Forest Gun for WWF Peace Direct, and I passed that over to somebody, and then like sort of uh, the I was, this I was properly injured. I had tendonitis in the outside of my shin, and it felt like every time I put my foot down, someone was stabbing me in that shin, and I was in there thinking, I'm oh, fuck, this is it, this is this is game over, and I get myself a Twix and a, and a Gatorade just like I always did, and she goes, like, what are you doing? And I said. Oh well, I'm I'm running across America. I feel myself going already. He said I'm running across America, but I think I think it's over. I think I've stopped. And so to, I just and I said here you go, and I handed in the card. And it was the last one I had in my little waist pack, and I thought that's the last one I ever write out. And I just broke down, sobbing in tears. Not like sort of a little. <laughs> this was a proper, oh, you know, so you know everything had gone into this, you know, and maybe even like ten years had gone into it. All the talking, all the all the planning, and then suddenly cocked it up. You know, less than, you know, I got to, don't even know the maths on that, but you know, probably like five percent into it, and uh, she just comes around from the um, from the from the, like the till and gives us a huge hug. And I said, "Oh, don't, don't hug me," I said I'm so sweaty. She went, she went, "Don't worry, son, we're all sweaty down here." And then a mate comes out and she's like, what's happening? And then she tells him, then she's already crying. I'm crying. I go out of the road, stuff myself with this Twix and a Gatorade. In the meantime, like, so the Nads has just gone, I found you a physio. Well, that's, we've got to go to the doctor first and spend 250 quid for something to say, you need to go to a physio, even though we go, we knew that. And um, I've got a little, little game for you here. So we're in Houston. This female physio. What do you reckon her name was? The clue's where we are. Give us the first letter. W. <laughs> Singer. Oh. Uh. <laughs> she wants to dance with somebody. It's Whitney yeah, Houston, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, Whitney, yeah. Whitney, Houston, Whitney yeah, yeah. from Houston uh -huh. sorted me out. And then, <laughs> so that was the sort of a thing where I thought it was game up. So that was awful. Sticking me card into like a hotel thing when I was on my own in the middle of nowhere, and they just go, oh, It's been declined. And I just go, No, nah, no, nah, that's nah, absolutely fine. And then, like, go on to my online bank, and it just goes, Like, sort of your over your overdraft limit. And I was just like, Oh my god. Um, one of the hardest bits though was, um, saying to that and Nadine because, like, she supported all, all the way from Mobile to Santa Monica to Jackson, Tennessee. She was leaving me when I was injured she was going because we had out of money and she was going to be, you know, similarly skint when she got home. But I don't think if I'd have not had her to support at the start, I wouldn't have turned around at Santa Monica. I'd have just gone, if I'd have been pushing me, me stroll at the start, I'd have just gone, I've had a good run. And I, there's no way I can go across America another four times. But like, she was just like, you can, we started the trip. So when she went off into uh, that cab, you know, like she was crying in the car and stuff. I held it together until I got on the greyhounds and I just thought, you know, I'm in big trouble here. Just like start pushing this stroller down the road. And um, this fella um, just outside, like you could tell that sort of, you know, sort of uh, he'd had a hard life. And uh, he said, what are you doing? I told him what he was doing. And he said, do you mind if I have a photo of you? Uh, and, and of me and I said took a photo of him and he said I've, I used to have a photo of me well so I should have had a photo of me but somebody took one once and then they never sent me it and I went I'm sending you this and I did send him it and that was like sort of you know the first interaction I had on my own and I just thought God people want to talk and when you want to talk you know sort of uh, you know sort of, that means that things could be all right and so I got dead sort of cocky on the first night, thought, right, I'm going to run as far as I can. I'm going to follow this fella's advice who'd also walked across America. And he said, just knock on someone's door and say, can I camp in your garden? Well, he said, yard. Um, and so I knock on this first uh, house and the fella answers the door. And I'm just like, hey, mate, I'm doing this. Can I stay in your garden? And he's just like, no. And I'm just like, cool. Because there's no argument. You can't just say, oh, mate, don't, don't be an asshole. You know? yeah, come <laughs> so, on. Yeah, no, come on. Yeah. I just go, I know you're only joking. Yeah. Just start getting me tent out. Because, uh, you know, as a copper later said to me, he said, you went onto somebody's porch in Carroll County after dark. He said, you're going to get shot doing that, mate. And um, But I carried on. And uh, I went past this fellow who had a caravan up his drive, or a you know, trailer, as they call it, knocked on the door. And, yeah, no answer. But, like, there's a little twitch of the blinds and... This fella just goes, who is it? I'm like, uh, uh, Rob from England. 
And like, <laughs> what do you say in that sort of things? Mm-hmm. You know, I wasn't going to give him the spiel through a window. And um, so he doesn't come out and I'm just walking down his pathway and he's like, he goes, what do you want? Comes to, comes to the door, what do you want? I'm like, oh, well, this is what I'm doing. Can I stay in your garden? And he goes, got any weapons on you? And I'm like, oh no, mate, I'm, I'm British. Just, just me razor sharp wit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thinking I'm dead funny. He goes, good. Cause I got plenty. And just pulls out this 10 inch carving knife from band. It's about, you know, you said before, did you ever fear for your life? And I just thought, oh my God, this is it. The first night on my own, you know, and the demon's probably still going to be in the air, you know? And uh, he goes, if anyone hurts my little girl, I'm going to hurt them real bad. And I was just like, mate, don't worry about it. I just wanted to camp in your yard. Um, I'll get off down the road. And he goes, hang on. So I'll call my wife, see if you can camp around back at a local store. And he goes in. He comes out like about 15, 20 seconds later. No way he's made that call. Not a check. He w- wouldn't have been able to. Um, and he goes, so, okay, I trust you. Come in. And I'm like, oh, fucking hell. Yeah, that was the, that was the noise that he made. <laughs> <laughs> it's that hot dog, I basically Yeah, I know. Through. Yeah, oh, my God. Well, so I was worried I was actually going to see my stomach contents, mm-hmm. but not coming out of my mouth, mm-hmm. just holding them in my hands, you know. And uh, if I hadn't seen his little daughter sort of by his leg, I thought he's not gonna he's not gonna gut me in front of her. And so I just went in because I figured if I leg it and he's he's in all case, he's gonna come after me anyway. And so um I go in there and he's just like, Are you hungry? And he's like, Oh yeah, mate, uh, thirsty. And so he cooks me this chili, gives me a can of coke, uh, and then I'm we're chatting for ages. He's just a local builder, he's gonna build a house for his family, and like so it was just like this so normal. You know, he's just like kids' toys on the floor. And literally 20 minutes previously, I thought I was gonna die. And um I go to put I say, I'm gonna have to go and put my tent up and he goes, Oh, don't worry about that, stay in my trailer. Goes into the trailer, pulls his massive high caliber deer rifle out because he, you know, he clearly still didn't trust me that much. You know, it's just like, oh great, thanks for the hunting rifle. And um, yeah, and then I was, but as soon as he'd gone, I was just like, lock that, lock that, mm-hmm. lock that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and they uh, lived to tell the tale. So um, the only other sort of thing where I generally thought someone was going to kill me, because um, I'd run through anywhere, like I'm from Liverpool, and you know, sort of, I'm not afraid of areas because I know that like sort of, you know, people would be afraid of where I grew up, but there's no reason to be, you know, because they're just people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you talk to people and treat everyone with respect, you're going to, you know, sort of, you know, fair enough if you walk around like somewhere, big city in the middle of the night with massive, like, sort of beats headphones on and looking at your new iPhone. Yeah, you're going to get it robbed, but that's just you being an idiot. And um, so I'd just go on Google Maps, uh, wherever it takes me. I'd say, right, I need, I'm in Nashville tonight. I need to be in Knoxville in three days' time. That's the route. And um, so it would take me through all these like sort of so-called bad areas. Like I went through like East Cleveland, South Chicago, and everybody who I met there was just so sound. But I was like right out in the sticks, and I was just sort of getting to Pennsylvania, like upstate Penn. And this fella comes out, and if you were going to stereotype him from what he looked like, you'd say scary neo-Nazi guy, like sort of, you know, skinhead, tattoos everywhere, like sort of all over his body, shirtless, like sort of, you know, huge... And he throws what looks like a bin bag across his garden. And I'm just like, that's a bit weird. Why would you do that? You know, it's not not towards his bin or anything. Then his bin bag hits the floor and it rolls over and it's got legs. I thought it's a dog. And I just sort of, I was trying to think what to do. And like, you know, you, you know when your brain thinks about 20 things in one go and it analyzes all these possibilities and throws about two out. And it was like, it came back to say something or not say something. I was thinking, if I say something here, I could be a dead man. But then he walks over and just full ball kicks it in the belly. Like sort of, you know, you hear it like sort of yelp and it lifts off the deck. He kicks the dog this hard. And then obviously my brain just overrides. And I'm like, oh, are you? God, you know, so yo, don't kick your fucking dog. And he's just like, what did you say? And I just thought, oh my God, he sounds like he's literally the scariest man in the world. And like, but my brain was loving this now. And he just went, you were uh, trying to engage full scary scouse, you know, like there's scary scouse accents have got me out of trouble in a number of places because people just go, I don't like what that sounds like, you know. Yeah. And uh, I've just gone, you head, don't kick your fucking dog. And he starts walking over towards me, and now I'm starting to get the uh, little squeaky bum again. And um, I get my phone out, so I take a photo of him. Or go, I didn't actually do it, but I said, mate, just took a photo of you, take one more step, I'm calling the police. But he basically just start. He just gets on his toes and sprints towards me. I'm just like, oh my god, I've got the pram. So I'm so grateful. I'm on the flat, 
and I'm going like that, and he legs me for about 300 meters. And I turn, I don't hear his feet anymore. And I turn around, and he's like, you know, gasping and stuff like that. And I just sort of, what's going on here? So I sort of stop, see what he's doing. He turns around and he runs back towards his house. Now, it's a fellow who's just like, you know, had an asthma attack or whatever because he couldn't run. And now he's decided to run back to his house. And I thought, he's getting the gun, he's getting in his truck. And I literally just went bang, just ran so fast. And uh, every time a car comes past me on my right, because I know he's not going to come across and nail me that way because somebody would see him swerve. So he's going to go up there and he's going to come back towards me. Every truck on my right, I'm just like, is it a massive skinner? Is it a massive skinner? And it's just like, and uh, like my heart rate was up there. And I eventually find this sort of place and I've took a screenshot of the map and send it to sort of uh, Nadine. I just go, if you don't hear anything from me in the next 24 hours, you've got to direct police to this location because there probably is going to be a body, you know, or, or, or you know, some remnants of it. And, um, yeah, like, you know. What does she say then? Your messes when you send stuff like that? Yeah, well, that's the sort of thing, isn't it? You know, and she was just like, uh, I just said, listen, I'll update you as much as you can. She said, I can't talk now. I've just literally got to go. Uh, and I said, you know, it is what it is. There's nothing we can do about it. And so... I was off, but of course she'd have like all these sleepless nights and stuff like knowing because you you'd see me tracker. You know sometimes you know she would see the, the stuff that I'd uploaded. She was just like, "I'm gone." Like he's in the middle of nowhere and it's night now. Where's he gonna stay? And of course, like sometimes I'd be in like this cheap motel. Uh, sometimes I would be like sort of um. Me mum's got a rule with hotels: as long as it's got a lock on the door and clean sheets, it doesn't matter what it's like. And so that was what kept me going there. So I was in all these mom and pop motels of varying quality like some of them had like holes punched in the wall graffiti on the mirrors flickering lights above the shower and stuff and you'd be thinking it's like you know it's like something from Saul and um and then sometimes it'd just be this place where it's somebody's labour of love and they'd put you up and that'd be when I'd always I'd always call her when I was in like a nice place and say oh no don't worry you look I'm in this or I'm staying with somebody tonight and they're looking after me and uh I've never actually spoke with her about how much she worried, apart from that obviously huge incident, like, you know, and whether whether she changed, you know, sort of when um, when I was out there. But she never let any of that feed through to me. And, like, even when I was in San Francisco and, she, you know, she was pregnant at this point, she had to fly back. And so the last bit ended up pretty much being all on my own because um, my mate took over the driving and we'd literally just gone to Nevada when somebody crashed into the RV and wrote it off. And so then I was running through Wyoming in winter and all this dangerous sort of, you know, territory. Uh, but she was always just like, you've got to finish it. Because I was just like, I'll just come home. I'll just come home. We can just knock it on the head here. And she's just like, no, you finish it, finish it. How many, was there many wanted posters up in these places? Is <laughs> that, that a mess in problems and shit? Uh, the, 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 the more scary posters you would see would be when you'd be putting your tent up and you would see like sort of the signs like posted, trespassers will be shot and then shot again. And you'd be just like... Hopefully you ain't coming out tonight, mate. And uh, but like there was one moment where I was in um I was in Winona, which is just in the bo- over the border into uh, into Minnesota, and I picked up the front page of the paper and I was on it and it looked like a proper mug shot. And that day I'd been bitten on the eye by a mozzie, so I had like a huge swollen left eye. And then there was this in the paper and I felt like a proper you know like outlaw and I just. You know, put the paper down, got me snacks, and then left. I did nothing wrong. Like, I felt like mm-hmm. guilty. You know, the, this man is out on the road. You know, mm-hmm. how what was it like then coming up to the end of it? Were you happy or were you sad? Is like because I know people ask the question like, are you running towards something or you're running away to something? That's such a yeah, that's such a normal question when people do these kind of things. Like, how was it for you? Were you relieved or happy or were you thinking, fuck, man, like? Do you feel as if then something becomes missing because you've no, not yeah. done that extreme kind of stuff? I, I, I'd read this fella, um, a, a fella who'd run across called Paul Wheeler, and he said he spent like the first, like, sort of, you know, 98% of it wishing every day would end because it was hard. And then suddenly, with 2% left, he wished he could get every day back again. And it's like definitely an analogy there for getting old, isn't it? You know, and you just think, oh, God, I want this day at work over with instead of actually making your day at work nice for yourself, you know? And um, I always thought the fifth leg, I thought if I get to the end of the fourth leg, then it's all, you know, it's off. I didn't touch the credit cards. Uh, you know, I was happy to go into overdraft, but I didn't want to start getting heavily in debt for this sort of thing. But I thought if I get to the fifth leg, I'll, you know, throw credit cards at it, whatever, I'll sell my car, I'll get to the end. And I imagined it as this glorious lap of honour, you know, sort of running through the southern states, which I loved, you know, sort of as it was coming into spring. But I was just so 
depressed and down, even as I was approaching the fourth leg. And now there was money worries, there was injury worries. Uh, the mental side of things I thought was fine because I was just like, I'm going to have to be carried off this or, you know, can't afford to go on. And I go home for my last visa recheck. And my mate sort of, uh, actually the lad who took the photo, it's on the front of that thing. He just went, you don't want to go back, do you? And I went, no. And even though all, I had all these motivations, then they'd not changed. And he said, why? And I said, I don't know. I said, it, it might be something obvious. It might just be all these likes of, you know, like I called it death by 25 million cuts because, you know, that's roughly the amount of steps I was taking. And um, I just thought, well, I've got to go out there. The flight's booked. Let's just go and, you know, do it as it is. And then I got injured on the first day because uh, it snowed for the first time in this part of South Carolina for 28 years. And um, I used to really remember, like, sort of a, just like running along and I was listening to it, it was the Liverpool Everton match and stuff like that and um and Virgil van Dijk scored his first goal it's the first sorry to Evertonians listening who are bring, <laughs> bring, bring, bringing that up you've just lost half your book series well, no, 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 <laughs> no but the thing is they'll be made up because it serves me right because I slipped on some ice and literally tore my groin apart so there's some sort of karma there you know uh, <laughs> and so uh, here we go the Evertonians replaced the book orders <laughs> you know and um yeah, and so I was just like, this is cursed, I need to go home. And so I'd been running along and actually managed to limp my way through Alabama. And I thought, Forrest would, if Forrest knew he had a kid, he would have stopped and he would have gone home. And I'm sat there thinking, this is why I'm so depressed, because I know that uh, Nadine and B, uh, like our little, and aren't going to be able to be there, because obviously she's not even born yet. And I just thought, there's so often in life where we just make up these excuses why we can't do something. And they won't seem like made up excuses. Like one could be, I've got a good job. And so if I was just being devil's advocate, I'd say quit your job. And so I didn't have a good job. I was on the road. And so my problem was, uh, I haven't got B and Nadine at the end. So devil's advocate just goes, get them there at the end. Well, how do, how do I do that? You know, sort of, because uh, you know, I couldn't expect them to fly out on their own. So I plow on through. And I get to this point in a, in Arizona called the Twin Arrows, and it's where Forrest gets splashed with the mud and does have a nice day. Um, and I thought, right, that is beyond the distance of Forrest Ram. It's about, it's about 15,400 miles. And so I had a little ceremony when I went past the distance where Forrest did, and I just wrote on a girder sticking out the ground. I don't know if I'll ever see it again, you know. 15,228 15, miles. Rob Pope was here in the footsteps of Forrest Gump. For WWF and Peace Direct, all you need is love. And then the, the, the date. And I was, I was flying at this point because I knew I had about 150 miles to go. And I was going to go home, see my daughter getting born. And I'd, I'd, I'd floated this idea. And I just said, this sounds mad. But if I came back and we got beer passport, would you come out to the end? And the dean, like, you know, at the end of the day, she made everything so easy for me the whole way along she just said if it can be done then we'll be up for it and so i go back um i do a few marathons um including the london one where i uh set the world record for the fastest uh marathon dressed as a film character that's an easier quiz question you can probably guess who that was uh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually got the record off a fellow who dressed as elsa from frozen you know and so um so was, maybe my co costume is a little bit more of a cop out but it doesn't matter it's for charity in it and um the very next day of like, course it's self funds we're in an economy like and i'm just in there going oh with post like you know sort of mar hard marathon legs but this time i've got a uh, three and a half week old baby next to me and we go out and um the, the rv that'd been written off i'd miraculously it took over a year to get it fixed but we thought that was it we're never going to see it again and uh, our mate who was driving it when it crashed olivia went up to salt lake city came down to flagstaff with it and it felt just like the ending of a film everything was coming together you know so i had the girl i had the baby so to buy the, you know the rv was there had friends coming from everywhere and then those last five days were the lap of honour. And that was the only real point where I just thought, I'm definitely going to do this. And and we can, and it just basically was a was a five-day running party. <laughs> it's mad, isn't it, though? <laughs> that, that experience is an experience of a lifetime. How much does your mum play a part in your mindset going through that every day? Yeah, like so she was always there. The thing is, like she was sort of replaced for the bit because uh, by the charities, the charities became my mum because they were the difference. And and as a result, you know that's what she put forward. Um, but like I had lo loads of memories. Like I did the New York Marathon twice, and um, it's a funny story about this actually. Sort of, uh, 
I did it in 97 and 98 while mum was still alive. She comes out with us and um, she's trying to raise a load of money. Now, this is before the age of the internet and everything like that. Somehow she gets through to Richard Branson on the phone. Calls up Virgin, says, can I speak to Richard? Gets put through. And so he thinks she's someone else, obviously. And um, he, she just goes, my son's running this marathon. Can you, um, can you sponsor him? And he's like, Obviously, we can't like sponsor individuals because then we'll have loads of people like you calling me up every day saying, "Can you sponsor me, lad?" And um, so, but like, are you going out to see him? And she was like, "No." And he just goes, "There you go, like sort of business class flight return to New York." And if you need anything else, I'll put you in touch with me, PA. So she calls up uh, about a week to go. Couldn't find any hotels because there was no like booking dot com or anything like that then. And um, they said, okay, we'll sort it out for you. And this fella calls her up and goes, hey, man, we've got your place in the St. Regis. And she just goes, that's great. And he goes, is that okay for you, ma'am? She goes, Give, delivers that line, as long as there's a lock on the door, and clean sheets on the bed. And he goes, excuse me, ma'am, this is the Sheraton St. Regis, the finest hotel in New York and possibly the world, you know. And so I ran past that hotel when I was actually in New York and, like, that was a that was a real wobbly moment, especially because I then headed to Central Park and I was listening to John Lennon, saw you know the Imagine mosaic, and I thought, Jesus God! And then I start thinking, if my mum was here now, we'd have talked about sort of you know, because it would have been yeah, probably twenty years to, you know, to since we were last in New York, and there were always lovely lovely moments like that, and certainly um, when I went down the the final straight, I just thought, God, what would she have made of this? That's class. Yeah. What's the most most miles you've run in one day? So I've gone further than that now. Uh, like so, I've like I've not like so you know you see some people doing some like real crazy things like hundred miles. Mm-hmm. So the most I've done in a day is eighty. Uh, the most I did uh, that day uh, was uh, sixty three miles. Sorry, that trip was sixty three miles, and uh, I was desperate to get to this cafe. And um, by eight o'clock, because it's shut. And then I got there about 8.40 and I was just like, you're kidding me. And I knew I was going to have to stay in the lobby of this post office overnight. I just got, I'm just going to try it just in case. And I go there and it turns out it wasn't like just a cafe, it was a bar. And I go in through the door of this bar and this fellow just goes, oh my sweet Lord, Forrest Gump's here. I didn't know I was coming. And then the amount of drinks I got bought that night, like so let's just say the day after the 63 miles was not anywhere near as far as that mm-hmm. you know that's unbelievable though what's um <laughs> going forward for the future brother you got any more extraordinary things planned well so i like as you can see with the hair and stuff i like doing the doing a job well and um mm. so i ran like distance wise probably as five times across america but if you look at the map it looks like about four and three quarters and so i want to go out to the point where i finished uh and just go to one more ocean i, I did like my time on that santa monica pier and there's a bubble gump at the end you know so i reckon if i ever, ever end up having a nice shrimp gumbo at the end that'll do the job but uh there's unfinished business with australia and i think that'd be a nice place to run across yeah you've got more plans for it then just go over there and set something up and just fucking smack it out of the park defo man if you fancy doing uh, some support crew across i'm sure we find some interesting Definitely, guests brother, on the way I'm up for <laughs> any, get me content brother i'll do it but for anybody that's maybe like thinking about doing something like this what advice would you give for them like this is that's an unbelievable achievement to be the first person to do anything on this planet yeah. is unbelievable but for anybody that's thinking do you know what was it did you have any doubt at the start I, 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 I had a reasonable doubt. I never thought I'd do the whole five thing. I, you know, it's all well Why? and good saying it. I was just thought, it's just, there was an article saying, like, is it actually even physically possible? You know, and people were just sort of saying, like, oh, with the right support and, you know, like elite level nutrition, I thought there's no way I'm going to be able to do that. And so, you know, there's quite often a reason why someone hasn't done it before. And it either means it's just too stupid or it's too hard. And this possibly crossed the line into both of them. And so uh, my my athletic goal was to just, if I got to Santa Monica, and then I said, I, you know, whatever happened after that, I'd say I'd run across America. And people were just going to go, oh, no, but you didn't do what you wanted to do. I just go, I ran across America. Mm-hmm. And you can't take that away from me. But then after that, when I turned around, everything was for the charity. And so people say, did you ever want to, like, jib it off? And I was just like... Most mornings, because I'd be like, you know, I'd have to run 40, 45, 50 miles that day and I'd be knackered and my legs would hurt. And I'd go, well, I can't do it. And then you just say, well, you can, you know, you can do whatever you want, you know, you, but you're going to have to do it as well. Like I actually sort of uh, had to invoke this like internal tough boss. And basically if I didn't turn up for work, 
I would get absolutely bollocked or I'd get sacked. And, you know, the, the equivalent of sacking is just going home with your ta- tail between your legs and someone just goes, why did you stop in, in a Bowley, Arkansas? And I just go, oh, because I was knackered or I was, I was too much of a shit house to continue, you know? And right. so um, I had that. Then I had the positive reminders. And at the end of the day, I was just I just know that if my mum was there, she would have just said, why don't you just crack on and see what you feel like at lunch? And quite often that's what I did. I'd just get up and crack on. And then at lunch, sort of, um, I would have a real nice feed or meet someone sound. And then I'd look all around me and I'd just go, look at this, it's incredible, you know? And uh, I had this rule that if I had seven bad days in a row, because I was writing about it and posting on like the social, I'd go home because nobody wants to hear somebody who was in a really privileged position going, oh, my life's so shit, my life's so rubbish. And then, but take, take a look at this amazing horizon of a, you know, like sort of a cityscape or, you know, the mountains. And then they just go, you're doing me, I didn't, mate. You know, because this, you know, you can't moan about stuff like that. So, yeah, it's ridiculous, but it was doable. Yeah. And that's the sort of thing, as I said, people put these obstacles in front of yourself. Just like, you know, you might not be able to just like drop everything at the drop of a hat. You know, people just going, oh, yeah, but you already said circumstances fell into place. Well, if something changes, that means you're a step closer to your dream. Don't put something else in that space where the bricks just fell out. Just leave it there. And then some something will change again. And then, like, so if you surround yourself with the right people, you know, like, sort of, um, like, did Nadine think she'd be able to support me like she did? You know, maybe her achievement's even bigger because, like, so she could have just gone, I'm having none of this. And if she'd have doubted me, she was the only one who ever thought I'd do the whole thing. Yeah, she's the only one who really knew that I wanted to do it so bad. And, like, she just actually... I, I just remember the quote. She just goes, you'll do it. I just know you will. Mm-hmm. And um, I'd be like, I'm glad somebody else believes it. Yeah. So, so not somebody else, somebody believes it. Yeah, it's important that somebody believes in you, but your mum would be proud, man. Like, that's an unbelievable achievement. Where can people buy your book, Rob? It, it's available everywhere. Like, so, you know, all your sort of big, like, sort of shops, like your Smiths, your Waterstones, but uh, I'm a we'll big... leave the link in the description for people to buy it. That'd be amazing, yeah. And uh, I love like little indie bookshops as well. So if you've got one near you, go and support them. Mm. Get yourself, get yourself a cup of coffee and uh, and sit down. Apparently, like so even my mates who thought like they've been messaging me just going, I'm actually really surprised. I thought it was going to be a load of shit, but it's yeah. really good. And like, you know, some people have like it's only been out less than a week and it's like a decent sized book and people have got through it already, you know, yeah. and uh, still talking to me, so yeah. it's great. Well, <laughs> Would you like to finish up on anything, Rob? God, man, I just sort of say carry on doing what you're doing because I think you are going to, um, especially in, in your sporting field, man, it looks like you're on a little bit of a journey yourself. Yeah. And like sort of, you know, you need to keep surrounding yourselves with people who tell you you can do it. And from what I've heard on the pods, you are, man. Like sort of, uh, I just I just absolutely love, I've listened to your Jimmy White one about 10 times. Yeah, it's just so good. That, brother. <laughs> Listen, mate, you're an inspiration, man. Absolute honour to have you on today. And I look forward to seeing what you do for the future, brother. Cheers, man. Thank God you very much. You, mate. Thank you. Cheers. Boom.